Today, I'm going to discuss some, some of those solutions and talk about why acquisition is such a difficult discipline. Not an impossible help, why such a difficult discipline. Sorry to interrupt, Professor. Your mic is a bit muffled. Um, it's very hard to hear. It's like talking over sort of like static over a phone. I don't know whether it's my mic or my mask. I don't I can't do much about my mask. It might be my mask. That's good. How about now? It's about the same. I think uh, I might have to get the mic fixed. So there's nothing I really can do now. I'm not allowed to take my mask off yet. Go off. And the mic is for the moment. I don't think there's another mic here that I can use. No, this is the only mic here. So for the moment, I'll have to stick with this. Can you guys hear me though? So the recording is muffled. So let's see. I don't know what's causing it. It might be just that. It's when you get closer to the table, it sounds better. Do you think I, that's the that's the other mic. So maybe I'll use the other mic. This mic is better. It's perfect. It's actually a lot better. Okay. So let's stay with this mic. So today we we're going to talk about what it is about the acquisition process that leads to so many failures. So let's take an M&A point. Let's say it's a friendly merger between two publicly traded companies. Who's the Hamilton line the room when it happens? Let's see who's in the room putting the deal together. You got the acquiring company's management and the acquiring company's management banker. You got the target company's management and the target company's management banker. You got two invisible groups that are not in the room who are paying and were very interested in the deal. One is the acquiring company shareholders, the other is the target company shareholders. So you got six different groups here. Only one of those groups actually comes out a loser in this deal. Let's start with the obvious winners. In that room, who's going to be the obvious winners? Yeah. The bankers, the acquiring company bankers, the target company bankers, they're going to get deals. The, the acquiring company managers and target company managers, do they lose? The, usually the uh, target company managers win. And the... Everybody wins. Manage it's not their money, it's other people's money. You know, okay. you know take Parag Agrawal, right? Poor guy on Twitter. Before you feel sorry for him, if he gets fired, you know how much money he makes? $42 million. $42 million. Don't spend too much time feeling sorry for the guy, right? So the managers are fine. The bankers are fine. And now you got two groups of shareholders. If I gave you a choice of whether you want to be shareholders in the acquiring company or the target company, which would you rather be shareholders? In? Okay. And let's see if that's in fact borne out by the numbers. This is basically a summary of what happens around announcement dates, so acquisition announcement dates on deals. The red line is what happens to the target company stock price. So around the deal, so day zero is the day the deal is announced. You can see the stock price chart. In theory, there is no information about the deal that happens before day zero. But you see why that's a lie? You see the stock price starting to drift up in the days before. Now I could give you all kinds of cynical explanations, but I won't even try. Clearly somebody knows something and is trading on it, no matter what the SEC tells you. But the bulk of the jump happens on the announcement day. So if you're a target company shareholder, your, tar your stock price up 15%, 18%, 20% on the announcement of the deal. Look at the blue line. That's the acquiring company shareholders. It's pretty much looks like a flat line. No? And in fact, when you now after the deal is announced, there's a drift, but the drift is downwards. On, in summary, across all these studies, the acquiring company stock price drops about 2%. He's saying, this is good. Target company stock price is up 15%. The acquiring company stock price is down only 2%. And then we come out as winners, right? Or what am I missing? The target company stock price goes up 15. The acquiring company stock price drops only 2%. On average, that must be good for the market, right? The average of those two numbers. Is, what am I missing when I say that? Uh, yeah. The size, of it, like the relative size. The acquiring company is bigger or smaller than the target company? Usually the acquiring company is a lot bigger than the, the uh, target company. When Microsoft bought Activision, you know when Microsoft stock price did on the day the deal was announced, it was down 3%. Activision stock price was up about 30%. But 3% of $2 trillion is a lot of money. 
Activision was a $60 billion company. It goes up to $78 billion. Looks like a big deal, but you actually, if you look at the collective market cap of the two companies, the collective market cap actually went down. So at least on the acquisition day, you can see acquiring company shareholders are never as excited as everybody else. Like who's everybody else? All the managers are excited about the deal. The bankers are excited about the deal. The journalists get excited about the deal. But the only group that seems to be sober at the time this is happening is the acquiring company shareholders. And they seem to be saying, hey, you paid too much. They didn't say the deal is a bad deal. They're just saying you paid too much. No. But also what about like once actually acquisition like, is That's going to be the next part, because if you ask managers of these companies, you know what their defense is, they don't see what we see, which is what all the synergy numbers, we've got projections coming out of everywhere, and we've got this great stuff, they, and it, it's true, right, managers do know more than the shareholders do, or, or the, the investors do. So there's a good way to test it out. If you track what happens after acquisitions and managers are right, what should we see? We should see the synergy. We should see the increase in earnings. We should see the growth rate. Yeah. Oh, I just mean like, I don't mean like from actual like fundamentals. I just mean like, like, you know, like when like, you know, merger arbitrage, like once the actual deal completes, like- now that that, that, like, that can't like, explain any of this stuff, right? Because after the deal is complete, it's not like the acquiring companies recover the 3%. This has nothing to do with the target company. A lot of that arbitrage you see is around the target company stock price. This is about the acquiring company getting back that loss in value, right? So the target company you have to explain nothing. Shareholders are happy. It's the acquiring company that you're trying to explain what the heck is this all about? So if you track these deals through, there's some very interesting follow-up steps. McKinsey, for instance, used to do these studies every five years. They've stopped, which might tell you that they're not finding good stuff and they've stopped reporting it because it gets in the way of their business. Uh -huh. Where they looked at past deals and they asked two questions of every deal. First question they asked was, is the return on capital you make on acquisitions greater than your cost of capital? That's a fundamental question you ask about any product, right? And second, does doing a merger improve the acquiring company relative to its peer group. In other words, if you tell me there's synergy, it should show up as you improving relative to the peer group. And they discovered that half of all of the companies they looked at failed at least one test and the third failed both tests. KPMG in the late 90s looked at about 9,000 plus deals. And these were deals all motivated by that magic word synergy. And they found that more than 80% of the deals, there was no synergy a reverse synergy. You know what reverse synergy is? Two companies come together and the combined camp company actually does worse than the two companies standing alone. Less than 17% of all deals, there's actual synergy created. We're gonna talk about why that might be today. But if you look at the evidence, clearly shareholders are on better ground making that prediction about acquiring companies and what managed, because if you believe managers, every deal should pay off. Or most deals should, and they don't. Now, until about 30 years ago, almost all of this research and acquisitions came from the US. The data was here. And 30 years ago, if you were an emerging market company, an Indian company, a Chinese company, a Brazilian company, you know what the way, the way things work? A US company would acquire an Indian company, a European company would acquire a Chinese company. Why? Because US and European companies were big and Indian and Chinese companies were small. That started to shift as well. In the last 20 years, increasingly emerging market companies have been able to buy US and European companies. I'll give you that at least in the, in the case of India, when this started to happen. About 20 years ago, Indian companies for the first time acquired enough theft to be able to go out and buy European and US companies. And for Indian investors, this was a moment of nationalistic pride. Finally, we're big enough to be able to be the acquirers. Be careful what you wish for, because it turns out that Indian companies are repeating exactly the same mistakes that US companies have. In fact, if you look at what happens around announcement periods to Indian company stock prices, again, focus on zero. That's when the announcement is made about the acquisition. Initially, I guess the nationalistic pride works. The stock price continues to go up for about two months. So the cumulative return is what's happening to the stock price around the market. So you're actually doing better than the market. Then somehow around two months, again, sobriety starts to kick in. 
and you start to see this recognition that maybe they paid too much. And in fact, we tracked them 20 months after. Guess what? Not only have you given up all the gains you got at the time of the acquisition, you're now down 10, 15, 20% relative to, you, to where you were before the deal. This is a global problem with acquisition. And I'll add one more layer to why this should worry. If you look at all of the evidence in acquisitions, it's quite clear that the collective evidence suggests that acquisitions are a loser's game. That if you go out and you grow through acquisition, the odds are against you. They're not guaranteed, the odds are against you. And if I were to summarize the evidence, it is that acquiring companies pay far too much for target funds. They overestimate the value of synergy, at least at the time of the acquisition, and they have a really difficult time delivering on their promises. And we've known this for almost 40 years. The first study on acquisitions pointing out these issues came out in the 1980s. And the reason I emphasize that is that we're human beings and we're supposed to learn from the evidence what should be happening over time. We should be getting better at this, right? We shouldn't be making the kinds of mistakes we made. We don't have the excuse of saying, we didn't know this was happening. But that doesn't seem to be happening with acquisitions. If anything, our mistakes are getting even bigger over time rather than smaller. And that suggests to me that there's a problem with the process. This can't be an issue of mechanics. It's a problem with the process. So today I want to talk about what the problems are with the M&A process. Some of you might already start to see the foundations for why so many deals go bad. But clearly, if you look at the collective evidence, deals, acquisitions, have not been value adding, they've been more value destructive. And the question is, what is it about the process that caused it? So I'm gonna do a very simple way to bring home why so many deals go bad in terms of mechanics. I'm gonna argue there are seven sins in acquisitions and I list them out. And we're gonna go through very simple tests to see how each sin pays off. The first is what I call risk transference. You know what that is? A safe company looks at a risky company and seems to magically believe that by buying the risky company, it makes the company safer. We'll see how this plays out in terms of mechanics. It's called risk transfers. The second is the acquiring company has the capacity to borrow money at a really low rate. It uses it to fund an acquisition and it pays a premium. I'm gonna argue that these are debt subsidies and I'll tell you why I use the word subsidies. The third is that magical word control. Now, if you go to work in M&A in a bank, you know how control plays out, right? You value a company, and then what does a banker do? Add 20%. Magical, it pushes up your value. We're going to come back and confront the question, what exactly is the value of control? Where did that 20% come from? I'll give away the secret, because when you talk to your banking friends, and you can talk about, hey, here's where it comes from. And why I think it's such a bad rule of thumb to use in every episode. Fourth, I want to come back and talk about synergy. Clearly, it's a word that you see used constantly around m and I want to talk about what is synergy and why I think it's often miscategorized, why it's so difficult to deliver on synergy and how to value synergy. I'm always surprised by bankers say, can you really value synergy? You just paid 15 billion. You better be able to value it. You can't tell me you paid 15 billion for something you can't put a number on. I want to talk about pricing in the context of m and We talked about pricing, right? What do you do in pricing? You look at other companies and what people are willing to pay for that. And I understand, you know, acquisitions are a pricing process. We're going to talk about what it is about pricing and acquisitions that actually makes it worse than traditional pricing or conventional pricing and how to counter that. The sixth problem, I think, is part of the core problem. If you're rational, what should you do? You should do the analysis first and then make the decision afterwards, right? You don't decide to go to NYU first and then do your research on which college to go to. That kind of is backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, though some of you might've made that decision, your parent might've made the decision. It's too late to fix that now. But in acquisitions, that, that's exactly what seems to happen. Companies seem to decide they're going to do a deal and then they go looking for justification which means a banker's job, and I don't blame the banker for it, is to provide them cover. Verdict first, trial afterwards. And finally, I want to talk about why I think we get away with so many bad deals. There's no accountability. The way I describe it is you're a manager at a company and you take a bad product, a $15 million bad product, you get fired. You do a $15 billion acquisition and you overpay by 50%, you get promoted. There's something about this process 
So there's absolutely no accountability built in. So let's start with the first one. Each one, guess what I'd like you to do? I'm going to take you through seven tests and I want you to be honest with yourself about whether you're passing this test. They're gonna be like multiple choice questions. There's gonna be a right answer and a wrong answer. If you get the right answer, put a check against you that you passed. If you got a wrong answer, I want you to try to explain away why you got the wrong answer. You're really, you should be. You know, that's really why you go to business school is you'll make the same mistakes that everybody else does, but you're, you're able to explain your mistakes away much better than other people are. You know, this is why I did it. So you can tell me this is why. It and if you fail more than two tests out of these seven, please, please don't go to NMA. I mean, there's only one person here direct. If you, I mean, she's going to get at least five, right? No, at least, I, I think seven, definitely. I'll, I'll do the seven for you to make sure you pass. But think of this as a self-test to see why things go wrong. So let's start with a very simple setup. I'm going to show you a target company. And I want you to give me a valuation of the target company status quo before an acquirer shows up. I'll make things really simple. This company has operating income of 20 million pre-tax and 12 million after tax. It's going to generate that income every year in perpetuity with zero growth. The keyword is zero growth. And its cost of equity is 20%. It's all equity funded as a company. So $12 million in after-tax operating income, zero growth rate in perpetuity. So 12 million every year in perpetuity. And the cost of equity slash capital is 20%. What is the status quo value of this target company? You don't need a calculator for this. It should be really straightforward. Looks like you're missing some information, right? What am I not giving you? No capex, no depreciation, no working capital. But I don't think you need it. Why not? But that's not cash flow, right? You, know, you started off that property income. How do we get to free cash flow? We add depreciation, subtract. No you have no growth. When you have no growth, you don't need reinvestment. If you don't need reinvestment, net capex is zero, changing working capital is zero, free cash flow of the firm is 12 million every year for that. Cost of capital is 20%. So what's your value? 60. 60 million. Everybody agree with that? That's your base number. So now we're going to play banker. And your job is to convince me to pay more than 60 million. That's really your bottom line, right? So let's start with the first round. I'm the acquiring company. I'm much safer than you as the target company. My cost of equity is only 10%, not 20%. What's the value of the target company today? You see what I'm asking you, right? Should I, should I continue to use 20? Should I, or should I use the 10%? After all, I'm buying the company, it's my cost of equity. What do you think? Well, Charlie, what I should use is your 10%, and you should use my 20%. What does that even mean? <laughs> Essentially, I mean, I can pay only one price, right? I, if I use ten percent, let's go it through. I'll come up with one twenty minutes, right? Yeah, well, you should use. The I'm the only one that counts here as the acquiring company. I'm going to pay for your company, so what you use kind of is irrelevant. So you're saying I should use the ten percent? No, I'm saying you should use the twenty percent. Oh, I should use the twenty percent. Let's make play devil's advocate because we go into banking, you're going to get pushback. Half of all acquisitions use the acquiring company's cost of equity cap. You know what? They argue that you came up with the money and therefore it's your cost of capital. It's one of the dangerous things about using the word cost of capital. It sounds like the cost of funding, right? Yeah. What's wrong with it? Yeah, no, I was gonna I was gonna make that point of like they meant by borrowing like as in the capital market. In other words, they make they make this about cost of funding. And I think cost. look at how much people are talking about Elon Musk's cost of funding in value and split. Versus the actual risk of the yeah. company, yeah. Ultimately. The reason I need to use 20% goes back to a capital budgeting principle that we often forget. You know what the discount rate for a project should be? A discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of the project, not the risk of the entity or person looking at the project. Yeah. Also, wouldn't over time, like the, your, your firm's cost of capital, you like your firm's way up. That's a very dangerous place to go because then you're suggesting I use some melded cost of no, capital. No, I'm not saying you yeah. should, but I'm saying also like if you use like this, this, like what if, if this becomes 10% of your business, like then over time, your cost of equity will start to go up, but that's neither here nor there, right? Because in a sense, that's about the melded. Don't even bring the melted company in. You don't need to. Okay. If you follow the rules that the discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of the project, this target company's risk is captured by its 20% cost of equity, which means I can't make it more valuable just because I have a lower cost of equity. 
And in fact, if I do that, I will find every company that's riskier than me look cheap, right? It's just a pure math. Because if I have an 8% cost of capital and I go around and you know, buy companies which are riskier and use an 8%, of course, everything is going to go off of that. So that's the first lesson. Do not transfer your risk characteristics. You know, put, put in very mechanical terms, what unleavened beta should you use to come up with the cost of equity for a target company? It's a target company's unleavened beta. It's not your unleavened beta. It's not a weighted average unleavened beta. It's always the target company's unleavened beta. Everybody agree with that? As I said, half of all acquisitions fail at the very first step. You're using the wrong company's cost of equity. Let's make this a little more subtle. Let's say as a, um, I'm the acquiring company, I have a triple A rating. How do I get it? I've been really careful and prudent for the last hundred years. I've built this nice, safe company with a lot of excess debt capacity. And I plan to use this on this acquisition. In fact, I plan to borrow half the money I need for this acquisition at a 4% cost of debt, pre after tax cost. You see what I'm going to try to lead. Remember, my job as a banker is to try to get you to pay more. What am I trying to get you to think mechanically? I'm trying to get you to think in terms of cost of capital, weighted average, right? And it looks like this deal is going to be funded half with debt, half with equity. The half with debt will have a 4% cost of debt because that's what I can borrow at. That's for the moment. It's, it's not going to be true because the cost of equity should go up. Let's say the cost of equity stays at 20%. My cost of capital, if I take a weighted average, half and half, 20, half at 20%, half at 4% will be 12%, which will push up my value to 100 million. Mission accomplished, $40 million premium. And if I pay that, what exactly have I done? I paid a $40 million premium to the target company shareholders where did that premium come from? It came from the fact that I've been really careful for the last 100 years as an acquiring company. I've accumulated debt capacity. I have a look. What business is of yours as a target? If I paid to the target company shareholders a $40 million premium, I'm essentially subsidizing them for something that they absolutely no role in creating. I'll suggest a rule for you. Render unto the target company shareholders that which is theirs and not a penny more. This has nothing to do with them. So you know what I'm saying, right? When you're valuing a target company, don't use the funding mix that the acquirer gives you as their funding mix. I actually saw a valuation of Footy yesterday, which used the three and a half percent cost of capital. You know how they came up with the three and a half percent cost of capital? How is Elon planning to fund his acquisition? Oh, market. Primarily with debt at a 3% rate. So what they've done was they said 90% of the financing is going to come from debt, 3%. So, it's just a so, rate. so basically they took the, the actual financing, but what they were failing to factor in is why is Elon Musk able to borrow 35 million? It's not because Twitter can carry 35 million in debt. It's because he's worth 260 million at in Tesla. He's using his Tesla shares. This has nothing to do with Twitter. If you're paying a premium for Twitter, I hope and pray it's not because you were able to borrow money at 3%. Because this can't add value to Twitter as a company. It actually makes your life simple. It means you don't care about the funding, actual funding mix on an acquisition, because it has nothing to do with the target company. And using that funding mix will actually create a premium that subsidizes target company shareholders. Which brings me to the control premium. I'm going to give away a little secret on how bankers ended up with a 20% control premium. There's a database called Merger Step. I think we might have access to it as you might have access as Stern students. It's not a fancy database. All it does is it tracks and records every single acquisition that happens in the US market. It now might even be global. And what it records are two numbers the market price before the acquirer showed up and the actual price at which the deal got done. So think about this thousands of acquisitions, there's the market price, there's the acquiring price. And then they actually, to help you, in case you don't know how to do Excel, they tell you what the percentage difference is between the acquiring price and the market price before the acquirer show. You know what that average for that number across all deals is roughly? About 20%. That's where the 20% came from in the database. But even if that, if you trust that data, my question is, why is it a control premium? What else do people pay premium for, even if they're Doing, they could be paying premiums for synergy, you know. It, it could also be for stupidity, right? If you overpay for a company, where is it going to show up? It's going to show up in that premium. To take that 20% and call it a controlled premium 
and add it on to the value of every company is idiocy. But that's what we're doing right now. So let's dig a little deeper on what the true value of control is. And the target company that I showed you, remember what the, the architect operating so much? 12 million, right? Let's say they're badly run. They're inefficiently run. That if you ran the company, you would run it much better. And you believe that you can earn a 30% pre-tax premium. So if you're 20 million, you make 30 million. After taxes are 12 million, you make 18 million. You see what will happen to your value of your company? It's going to be 90 million instead of 60 million, right? Instead of using a 12 million base, you want to use an 18 million. There's a 30 million dollar control premium. That's a 50% premium. Well above the 20%. Why? Because the company is badly managed and badly run. If this company were already perfectly managed and perfectly run, guess what the control premium should be? It should be zero percent. Who comes up with this crap of 20% for every company? Because this is a continuum, right? From zero percent for a perfectly managed firm to 300% for an abysmally run firm. You can put Twitter somewhere in that continuum, you know, depending on what you think about the company. But if your view is Elon Musk, and this I think is a strong, I mean, clearly can't be synergy because it's not, he's not planning to bring Twitter into Tesla. It's going to be a standalone company. If it's control, you can ask, what will he do differently at Twitter that will lead to a higher value? And that's why you can see different people can disagree about whether this is a good deal or a bad deal, but it's got to come from that, not from the fact that he has access to debt at 3% rate. That has nothing to do with the discussion. So when you think about control premiums, and this is, I think, a broader business, and be careful about these rules of thumb that you see floating around. 20% control premiums, 10% liquidity discounts, whatever. They'll often be backed up by people who think this is, this is based on data, and they'll show you the average. And they seem to have forgotten their statistics. When you look at an average, you have to look at the standard errors. You also have to ask, what else is in that average? So even if the data is there, it doesn't mean you can use that premium as a premium on every single average. You had a question though? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's talk about synergy. I'm going to give you my definition of synergy. And then I'm going to throw a few items at you. You tell me whether it fits the definition. The definition of synergy, don't tell me one plus one is three, it's the most terrible definition I've ever seen. It breaks every math rule that we know. So I'll give you a different definition. The definition of synergy is two companies come together. And a combined company is able to do things that each individual company couldn't have done standing alone. That is the key to synergy, is the individual companies couldn't have pulled this off. If you use that definition, you can already see how people often put the wrong things in synergy. I've actually seen people say, this company is badly run. There's a lot of synergy. Badly run is not synergy. You can take a badly run company and run it better, but it doesn't need another company in there. So the essence of synergy is two entities coming together are able to do things they couldn't have done a standalone. So I ask you, is it possible there are synergies? Of course there can be synergies. The synergies can come from saving costs, it can come from higher growth, it can come from even a lower discount. Let's say you value that synergy though. Let's say you come up with a hundred million as a value synergy. Should you as the acquiring company pay that as a premium? Why not? Because that's not currently the value of the company, like that synergy just doesn't exist right now if that company were standalone. Yeah. So if they can go in somewhere else to... Like if they were so what would you offer them as a premium? Would you offer them nothing? Would you offer them a portion of the hundred men? I just wouldn't offer them a premium if it's not there. But remember, you need both companies. This is like a dance, right? The tango takes two to dance. So you can't just tell them that they're not... See, you're not... You can't create the synergy on your own, right? You need the other... So I would think you'd need to negotiate, right? I mean, and would it depend on, say, your bargaining power with them? Yeah, you try to get out larger share, but you definitely need to give them something, right? Otherwise, your alternative is you get nothing at all. You'd rather get 60 million instead of zero, so if you've got to give up 40 million. So clearly, it's got to be bargained for. Who will have the stronger hand will depend on, because synergy needs two parties, who's more unique? So let's say you're the only Mongolian company in town, and I'm a U.S. company, and I want to be in the Mongolian market. Guess what? That Mongolian company has a lot of competitive advantages because they're the, the player that you're going up. So this is a negotiating issue, but, but there's a stopping point, right? So when you go bidding for synergy, what company do you need to stop at? 
you need to stop at 100 million. That's the most you can pay. You know what companies typically pay on synergy? For 100 million, they pay 150 million. And this is where the person at the bargaining table clearly went off the track. We'll see why it happens, and I'll give you an example. Before I do that, though, let me lay out the different forms synergy can take. Synergy can be operating synergy or financial synergy. I'll give you the simplest operating synergy that you can keep in mind. The simplest operating synergy is cost savings. Two companies in the same business come together and the combined company has lower costs. Why? Because they have overlapping distribution systems, marketing systems. I know whether you've been watching, JetBlue has made an acquisition bid for Spirit Airlines. Spirit has fought this off. But if JetBlue by, by Spirit, it's not that they're going to get higher growth. They're hoping to cut costs in some of Spirit's routes, maybe use some of Spirit's routes or as their routes to make more money. But this is a merger where cost savings might be a bigger factor than higher growth. Economies of scale. The other form of synergy is more exciting because the upside is much greater, which is growth synergies. Growth synergies can take one of three forms. The combined company is able to earn higher returns on its new projects than the individual companies could have a standalone company. So the standalone companies could make only 12%. The combined company is able to earn 15%. Why it's in a stronger market position, therefore it can charge higher prices. That might work for JetBlue in some of its markets, right? Is there JetBlue and Spirit are the only airlines flying from Newark to some Fort Lauderdale? It might be that by having this combined company, you can charge higher price, higher return of capital. It could be that you can take more projects as a combined company than you could ever standalone companies. So standalone companies, company A could take six projects, company B could take four. The combined company can take 15 projects. There's more opportunities. Or the company, the combined company, can earn higher excess returns. Remember, excess returns is what you earn over and above your cost of capital. That comes from having a stronger competitive position. So clearly, if you can tell me what benefits you can get as a combined company, it's my job to find the number and valuation to reflect those benefits. Those are operating synergies. Are it's cost savings or higher growth? I would love to tell you that most mergers are motivated by operating synergies, but they're not. Most mergers, in my view, are driven by financial synergies. The most common financial synergy is the one you should never talk about if it's a reason for a merger. It's taxes. You know what I'm talking about? Two companies coming together, they're actually able to pay less in taxes than they did as individual companies. By doing what? In some mergers, you're allowed to write up the book value of your assets after a merger. How does that help you? You get more depreciation. More depreciation gives you higher tax benefits. A money-making company buys a money-losing company. Do you see the benefits there? Before the merger, the money-losing company paid no taxes. The money-making company paid 40%. After the merger, the combined company might pay a 5% tax rate because the losses can be set up against profits. So it looks very sleazy, right? Hey, but I didn't write the tax law. You didn't write the tax law. To the extent that the tax law allows you to do it, companies are going to take advantage of it. There are countries which actually have explicit parts of the tax law that kind of encourage mergers. I'll give you an example. In Brazil, about 30 or 40 years ago, the Brazilian government decided that it was unfair that debt got a tax advantage through interest tax expenses being taxed in deductible, but equity did not. So they introduced a tax deductible item called interest on capital. I don't know the Portuguese word for it, but they have a clear term for it. So every year, the Brazilian government sets out a percentage, 11%. You know what you're allowed to do? You're allowed to take 11% of your book equity and claim it as a tax deduction, just like you do interest expenses. Yeah. By itself, you're saying, so what? When you do an acquisition, what happens to your book equity right after you do the acquisition? It's going to go up because you bring in a market equity, you make it part of your book equity. And in Brazil, that creates a tax advantage almost instantaneously. But the reason I said, if this is the reason for doing a merger, you should never talk about it. It's because if you say the word taxes and say, that's my primary reason, you know, the tax, the IRS and every tax authority in the world, if you have a transaction primarily motivated by taxes, what's the rule? They're gonna to try to stop it. Purely tax motivated transactions are viewed as non-economic and they're gonna stop it. I'll give you an example of what happens when you violate this rule of not talking about taxes. In 2015, 
Pfizer announced they were going to merge with an Irish company called Allergo, it's a UK pharmaceutical company. And the reason was actually very simple. US companies at that point in time faced, it's what, the US was one of six countries that actually taxed companies based on their global income. You had to pay US taxes on all income. Rest of the world, you pay taxes in each country based on, so if you're a UK company, if you had global income, you paid the taxes in the local country, but didn't have to pay UK tax. So here's what Pfizer was planning to do. Was planning, Pfizer was a bigger company. They were planning to buy Allergan. But after they bought Allergan, the headquarters for the company would be moved from the US. I think New York is their headquarters to Ireland. Overnight, or it might have been UK. Overnight, you've gone from being a US company to UK company. You think, what do I gain? From this day on, your global income will get taxed at local rates. This is a tax driven acquisition. So Pfizer CEO was in CNBC. And the CNBC anchor asked, Well, why are you doing this deal? And I expected Pfizer CEO to follow the right script, which is when you're doing a transaction motivated by taxes, talk about everything but taxes. Throw in the, the S word, strategic, synergy, this, that, quite a lot of smoke in the air. This idiot goes up and he says, we're doing this to save taxes. My jaw dropped. <laughs> it wasn't just my jaw dropping. You could see jaws dropping across the IRS saying, what? And in the next couple of weeks, all heck breaks loose. People are gonna get on the seventh floor and saying, this is terrible. US companies doing this to avoid taxes. Two weeks later, Pfizer had to withdraw the deal because it just wasn't going to fly. That guy should have been fired as CEO right away. I mean, who does that? But you can see why taxes can drive acquisition. There are two other financial synergies, two companies that by standing alone can't afford to borrow much money. It's not that they don't want to, but they can't. Let's say each company standing alone can borrow 10%. 10% debt, 90%. You combine the two companies, you create a larger and potentially more stable company, especially if they're in different businesses. You see the benefit? You can now potentially borrow maybe 25% or 10%. How does that help you? Remember, the primary advantage of debt is a tax advantage. It's another backdoor way of bringing in tax benefits, but that's a second potential financial synergy. I think if we remove the tax code, half of all mergers would stop. Because without the tax code, there would be no benefit. There's a third and final reason, and this is a reason that a publicly traded company should never use, but a private company can. Sometimes a company will do an acquisition, especially of a company in another business. And the rationale is we're doing this to get more diversified. Horrifically bad reason for a publicly traded company. Why? Because their investors are diversified. Because it's not that the investors have to do it, but the investors can choose to be diversified. You think, but we're just helping. <laughs> have you ever got online to buy a stock and paid a 30% premium? I haven't, but if you, if you have, I'd love to be a broker. As individuals, when you, buy when you buy a company to be diversified, you never pay premiums. The company does it, it's got to pay a 25 or 30. It's, a, it's an incredibly expensive way to diversify with a public company. But let's say you're a private business. Remember we talked about total betas? I know you've forgotten already, but it was on the third quiz. Basically, the total beta reflects the rest of the risk in a company. So the way we get a total beta is we take the market beta and divide by the correlation of the company with the market. Let's say you're a private business and you go buy another private business in a very different industry. You see the potential benefit? After you do the acquisition, you're still a private company, but the combined company is gonna have a higher correlation with the market. Why? Because in a sense, if you push this logical limit and I keep buying other private businesses, and I could build up what's the equivalent of a mutual fund with a correlation close to one by buying small private businesses. Sounds abstract, right? If you get a chance, look at any old time family group in probably Asia. I'll take, I'll take India. You take the Tardis and the Berlis, they've been around for 120 years. Take a look at what businesses they were. You know what you're going to find? The question you've got to ask is what businesses are, not, are they not in? They're in everything. Because when they were private companies, which they were 40 years ago, that is how they survived and reduced the total beta effect because they essentially became diversified as private businesses. And by doing so, they pushed the correlation up towards one. And the minute you do that, 
your total beta starts to look like your market beta. Diversification for private businesses is a potential synergy. So I'm gonna lay out a three-step process for value synergy. First step in the process is you got to value the acquiring company and the target company standing alone. Let me repeat that again. You can never value synergy by just valuing the target company. You have to bring the acquiring company into the mix. You value the acquiring company, the target company standing alone, step one. Step two, very easy, just add up the two numbers. You know what you're going to get? You're going to wait to value the combined company if there were no synergy. Valuation is added. Step three, take the combined company with all of the synergy benefits, lower cost, less taxes, lower cost of capital, higher growth, value the combined company with all the benefits thrown in. In step three, you're gonna value the combined company with the synergy. In step two, you've got the values of the two companies independently. You compare those two numbers. The difference is the value synergy. I know it sounds incredibly abstract. Let me give you an example. About 20 years ago, Procter & Gamble, at that time, the largest consumer product company in the world, bought Gillette, the razor company, fifth largest consumer product company in the world. Talk of synergy filled the air. And I decided I want to value the synergy in this deal. So remember, to value synergy, what do I need to do? First, I need to value Procter & Gamble standing alone. So that's the second column. And I came up with the value of $221 billion, Procter & Gamble. That's the intrinsic value. Then I valued Gillette standing alone, got about $60 billion. If I stop right there and say, if I combine these two companies and there's no synergy, what's the value of the combined company? It's going to be 221 plus 60, 281 billion dollars. So that's the value of the combined company with no synergy. So I decided to do a best case valuation of synergy. In a minute, I'll explain why I use the word best case. I took the combined company. They actually didn't call themselves Piglet, but I thought that would be a good idea. Procter and Gamble, Gillette, Piglet, no, no. But they never took up that suggestion. So I took the combined company and I took everything managers told me they would be able to do and assumed they could do it instantaneously. Let me explain. They talked about the possibilities of cutting $250 million in costs out of their marketing bus because these, both companies were big advertisers. I said, okay, I believe you. And I said, start tomorrow. You know why that's best case, right? And when you have two big companies come together and they talk about cutting costs, it takes a while for it to work through the system. I'm assuming it happens overnight. They talked about being able to grow a little faster, especially on the Gillette brand name, using Procter & Gamble's marketing to push them. And I gave them a slightly higher growth. With the $250 million cut in cost and a slightly higher growth rate, the value that I get for the combined company is 298.4 billion. The value synergy is the difference between those two numbers, which is 17.2 billion. Don't let it ever be said that in finance, we don't think there's a value to synergy. I'm valuing synergy at $17.2 billion. This is a good deal, right? Don't be so quick to say it's a good deal. What does it depend on whether it's a good deal? What have I not told you? Yeah. I'm sorry? That, so let's take the 17.2 billion. Let's say it's delivered. I still need to tell you something else that will tell you which is, whether it's a good deal. How much they actually paid for something? I didn't, I didn't tell you what price they pay. You know how much they paid as a premium? $25 billion. How the heck do you create value from m and if you take synergy that in your best case is worth 17.2 billion and you pay 25 billion? So I'm gonna say something that drives m and people crazy, but I don't care. At the right price, I will buy any company. At the wrong price, I don't care how great a fit there is. Think of how much of your M&A classes you waste on strategic fits and all these amazing stuff and how little time you actually spend on pricing. If you overpay, I don't care how great a deal this looks like, your shareholders will be worse off. I call this a best case deal, right? Because I'm assuming that everything happens and everything happens instantaneously. The reason I call it a best case deal is when companies talk about cutting costs, you know what the track record of companies and cutting costs is? Usually they don't deliver the entire amount. If you're lucky, maybe 60, maybe 70, 80%. Second is you probably have to wait, right? Two years, to three years for these cost cuts to actually manifest themselves. Is there a way I can compute the value? Of, so the 17.2 billion is best case. What if I told you you've got to wait three years for all of this to come to fruition? What did you need to do? Discount it back. Discount it back at what rate? The new synergy uh, rate. 
what is that mean? cost of capital of the combined company exactly do you see this so already you can see the play on this card race is in an acquisition to value the target company is the target company's cost of capital to value this potential synergy benefits because they come through the combined company use the combined company's cost of capital you've got to wait three years it's discounted back three years 17.2 billion discounted back three years at a nine percent cost of capital becomes 14 billion so is everybody clear on the process value the acquiring company value the target company add them up and then you can create a combined company with all the potential synergies joined take another another type of synergy much more precise not as exact let's say you work in best buy you electronics retailer and you buy zenith a company at one point in time that was a legendary electronics manufacturer you watch i don't know i'm sure many of you have zenith tvs now right i don't even <laughs> think you've even seen a zenith tv anymore it's a shell of a company let's say it's such a shell that the only significant asset left in the company is the amount of money it's lost over time that's a very bad place for a company to be in. they have an nol of two billion so basically when you buy zenith you're buying an nol of two billion right so the tax rate is 36 percent what is the tax benefit you're going to get from this deal? what's the tax synergy two billion dollar and well 36 percent tax rate two billion times 36 which is 720 million right and that implicitly assumes what about your taxable income to be able to get the entire tax benefit you need to have at least Two billion in revenues. Two billion, in, not revenues. You need two billion, two billion in taxable income, right? Let's say only a half a billion in taxable income, and you expect to have half a billion in taxable income every year for the next four years. What would happen then? You'd still get the seven twenty million, but you're going to get one eighty million next year. One eighty million. So basically, you're going to get one eighty million every year for the next four years. I hate to torture you with discount rates again. So the, obviously the tax benefit would be the present value of the tax. What discount rate should I apply on those tax benefits? The combined companies. Combined companies, what? Uh, cost of capital. 50 50 shot. No, Whenever you worry about discount rates, here's what I want you to think about. What is it that's uncertain in this, in this setup? Is the NOL known? Yeah, two billion is known. Tax rate known? Yes. What's the only thing you're uncertain about is the taxable income every year for the next year. Who's taxable income? It's Best Buy's tax. The Zenith has no taxable income. So it's Best Buy's taxable income. And taxable income is income to equity investors or to the entire thing? Taxable income is after interest expenses, right? You know what the right discount rate will be? It's got to be best buys. It's equity income, so it has to be best buys. Cost of equity. I want you to start reasoning through. Whenever you have a cash flow, I want you to start thinking through where is the risk in this cash flow. That's why last week when we did biogens licensing, and I said, what would happen if they license the U.S. government? You reason it through. You're saying that cash flow is guaranteed. The discount rate is going to be the risk-free rate. You know, we're too quick to jump to the cost of capital because we get so trained in using that as a discount rate, we start to use it everywhere. In this case would be the cost of equity of Best Buy because that's where the risk lies. So don't pay for synergy just because it sounds good. Okay? Pay for synergy because it's worth money, but you have to go through the process of telling me where the synergy is going to come from, valuing the synergy and negotiating for a share of that synergy for your stockholders. So let me ask you a question. Why do people end up paying 150% for synergy? This seems like common sense. When you value synergy, why do people keep paying? Put yourself at the bargaining table, right? You work for the acquiring company, I work for the target company. Let's say we both agree 100 million is kind of the synergy value. So what do you start offering me? You start offering me 20 million of the 100 million. I push back and say 180 million. You push back and say 40 million, which are 180 million. You say 60 million, say 220 million. What am I testing to see? Whether when you reach 100 million, you get up and walk out of the room. If I notice that you refuse to walk out of the room, you know what I've understood, right? That you want to get this deal done at any cost. 
That is the problem with acquisitions, is we define winning as actually getting the deal done. Bankers have always done that, and companies have fallen into this trap. The Wall Street Journal, the day after you get the deal, reports you as a winner of the deal, right? That you won this deal. They never say, that was a bad deal, they overpaid, you just won the deal. Unless you're willing to walk away, you're going to overpay. And the reason why you don't walk away is because you get caught up in this definition of a deal done is a win, a deal not done is a loss. And we've got to let go. But I'm a banker. I'm trying to get you to pay more. You're getting, to, you're very resistant. You've tried the, you try to use the lower discount rate, you can go there. So I tried different flaw. I said, look, you know, this DCF stuff, I don't know why you do that. We don't do DCFs and acquisitions. Let's do a pricing. Just why? You can do pricing, it's a transaction. And here's how I come up with the pricing. I collect a group of other companies in the sector that have also been acquired. It's called transaction multiples. So rather than look at all steel companies, I look at the seven steel companies that have been acquired in the last three years. I look at the premiums people have paid on them. And I said, no, these, these acquisitions, people have paid five times that. And five times your EBIT, which is 20 million, is 100 million. Pricing, right? There's nothing wrong with pricing. But what have I done in this pricing that should make you a little worried? Yeah. You only selected the acquired companies. In other words, it's a sampling bias. Do you see where the bias comes from? I picked a subset of companies, which are in fact likely to be the companies where people overpaid. And this is standard practice in acquisitions. People use transaction multiples all the time. It drives me crazy. It breaks basic statistical rules. You say, what, what choice do I have? Look at all steel companies. And if you want to pay a premium on that, then decide how much the premium should be because here's what happens if I use transaction multiples. I come up with a number that's already too high. And then guess what I do on that? I pay a premium on top of that. No wonder we dig holes for ourselves that we can't get out. And don't let me play the ploy of, don't worry, I'm going to put it as an exit multiple. You know what that means, right? I project numbers for five. You say, look, it's the near five. The fact that it's the near five doesn't make the statistical problems go away. And then I try a word that an acquisition almost often seems to do. I say, this deal is accretive. You know that word accretive? Yes. What's the other word that, that's twinned with accretive? Dilutive. And which one's supposed to be good and which one's supposed to be bad? Accretive is good, dilutive is bad. If I had my druthers, I would remove those two words, not just from finance language, but from the English language. So somebody help me out here. What makes a deal a creative? What do I look at to make a judgment on a deal being a creative? What's an accretive deal? It's nothing, there's no depth here. Uh, the combined company is higher than- Exactly, that's all that accretive means, which means that I combine the company, my earnings per share goes up. I'll tell you mathematically when that's going to happen. Whenever a high PE ratio company buys a company with a lower PE ratio, mathematically, the deal will be accrued. So if you believe that accretive deals are somehow good, you know what I've given you the license to do, right? You're a company that trades at 50 times earnings. Every company you look at that has a PE ratio less than 50 is going to be accretive because mathematically, that's exactly how it's going to play out. If I pay for a deal with debt, it's far more likely to be accretive than if I don't. Think of how all the bad ways I can make a deal accretive. In fact, McKinsey did a study of accretive versus, they took all deals, broke them down into accretive and dilutive. And here's what they found. Dilutive deals actually delivered more value than accretive deals, even though upfront they were presented as worse deals. So if I'm looking at pricing here, I don't have a problem with pricing, but obey statistics. These bias samples need to go. So we're gonna do pricing in an acquisition. Make sure you look at the entire sector, not just the companies that are going through transition. And don't push it off an exit multiple. You still have the same problem. One final point about, uh, about acquisitions. Often at this point, even if you convince the acquiring company that they're paying too much, they might still push through. You know what their argument is going to be? If we don't do it, a competitor will do it. In other words, these are called defensive acquisitions. You're doing a bad deal because you're worried other people might do an even worse deal. To which my response is, let them dig the hole and bury themselves. Why are you stopping them? But it's amazing how often companies feel that they have to do acquisitions because everybody else is doing it. 
don't justify deals because everybody else is doing it. That's the lemming part because you, you, so don't let words like accretive and dilutive even enter the discussion. They're irrelevant to whether a deal is good or bad. And don't do it just because everybody else does. Now, let me take you back to the bargaining table. Remember you were unwilling to walk away from that table even though you knew that this deal was becoming a bad deal. Let's explain why that happens. Acquisitions more than any other corporate action come from the top down. Well, you know what I mean by that, right? No middle manager wakes up one day and says, let's go de do an acquisition. What usually happens is CEO in the middle of the night, an angel comes to him or I don't know her and says, you got to do an acquisition. He wakes up in the morning or she wakes up in the morning and says, well, let's do an acquisition. And then the CEO goes and tells the management team, we have to do an acquisition. And then it kind of percolates down the organization. Everybody knows. This angel is like a managing director. Of a it could be a managing director of a bank. It could be the fact that you want to be the CEO of an empire, right? Big company. Lots of reasons CEOs do it. You know, there's actually a study that looked at what characteristics, you know, because when you look at companies, some companies grow through acquisitions and some companies don't. So the study actually looked at what it is that separates companies that grow through acquisition from companies that don't. You know what the most common characteristic that set those companies apart from? Overconfident CEOs. More than any other predictor, you, you, no, you, you talk to CEOs, some CEOs basically think they can pull off anything. Exclusive. These are the people who go out and do acquisition. They will overpay on it. They will convince themselves that anything can be pulled off. Overconfident CEOs. So when you see companies often doing things that are so stupid, remember that comes from the fact that the CEO is pushing for the deal. And, it's, and, and it percolates through. You know that that CEO doesn't want to hear you come back and say, this deal is too expensive, we shouldn't do it. You could try it, but you're probably going to get fired. They're going to replace you with somebody else. And that's why I don't blame bankers as much as other people do, because let's face it, you're a banker and you tell the CEO the truth. You know what's going to happen, right? He's going to fire and you're going to find another bank. It's like being on in Penn Station and you see a guy walking in front of you with a hundred dollar bills sticking out of his pocket. You lean over and pull the money out. And I said, What did you do? You stole the money. You said, Well, if I hadn't done it, somebody else would have done it anyway. So this is money that would be lost anyway. I would give $20 to charity. I'm a much better person than the next person. You can see why when CEOs make the decision to do these things at any cost, it's going to be very difficult for people to do that. Which brings me to this issue of accountability. You're all familiar with this company called Hewlett Packard, right? Legendary tech company. Oh, yeah, they did that. And, and for the last 20 years, this is a company that is a case study of bad corporate governance. And this is about 15 years ago. HP went out and bought a company called Autonomy. It's a UK-based software, business software company. And they paid a $5.2 billion premium on the market price to acquire the company. They paid $11.1 billion. So the time they did this acquisition, I actually looked at the reasons they gave, and I built up to the $11.1 billion. Wasn't there some potential fraud or something? We'll talk about it. This is a, the good part of the story. There's a bad part coming. So this is the time they did the acquisition. They had all these dreams built up. They started with book value, they added this, you know, accountants have reappraised it, then there was a market price, but they paid $5.2 billion primarily for what they thought would be the synergies in this deal. At the time that they did this deal, everybody thought they paid too much. At that time, the CEO of HP was a guy called Leo Portica. It's one of a group of equity research analysts in New York, and one of the analysts says, this sounds like an expensive deal, why did you do it? And this is, I'm going to use exactly the words Leo used because I don't want to be accused of putting words in his mouth. He said, we have a pretty rigorous process inside HP that we follow for all our acquisitions, which is a D dot C <coughs> dot F based model. I don't think this guy has any idea what the D, the C and the F stand for, but he used those words. And then he said, and we tried to take a very conservative view. He should have just stopped there because he kept going. He said, just to make sure everybody understands, autonomy will be on day one, accretive to HP. The magic word has shown up. Just take it from us. We did that analysis at great length, in great detail. We feel we paid a very fair price. And you give a great, this guy loves the word. Exactly like Trump. It, like, does, it doesn't matter, but he basically loves the word great. 
That's a great leg, great detail. So, very, very but, but here's, here's the bottom line. A year later, Leo Apotheker had lost his job and HP was writing off $8.8 .8 billion of the $11.1 .1 billion that they had, 8.8 .8 billion. So the time they did this, of course, they claimed it was somebody else's fault. They claimed it was accounting irregularity and autonomy that was playing. I said, I don't believe that. 8.8 .8 billion? So what I did was I took the $8.8 .8 billion and I started assigning blame. I said, let's blame the people who are responsible. I attached about uh, four, if you look at the first chunk, the first primary culprit, I said, Leo Potter, CEO of the company, I've got to attach at least 4 billion plus to him. The bankers, they're part of the deal as well. This is what they accounted for. The accountants agreed that they prepared with the numbers. So basically I took the $8.8 .8 billion write-off and I signed that write-off to different players. And I said, in a fair world, here's what we should see. The banker should be copying, copying up all the deal fees, right? And why am I paying you deal fees for the deal that you just did? Leo Apotheker should be giving back all those compensation packages he got. In fact, by the time this happened, Meg Whitman was the CEO. She should have been kicking back her bonuses as well. But here's the bottom line. Nobody, nobody paid a price for this bad deal. The bankers definitely didn't return their fees. The CEOs have to keep their packages. What about the shareholders? Well, somebody's paying and it's the shareholders. My question is when shareholders lose, how come we don't have accountability? How come you can do a hundred billion dollar deal and screw up badly and nobody's held accountable? Well, because you want people to be able to take risk. Well, that's not, that's a stupid reason, right? I mean, it's, uh, if you got enough, so show me a deal because where you got an $8 billion. Dollar. This has nothing to do with risk. This is stupidity. You overpaid with other people's money. Yeah, but I mean, the law is like the business judgment. The business judgment role is what protects them. Like, you're not going to be able to- The fact that you can't sue them doesn't mean they can't be fired, right? So you sure. can't sue them. So basically, that can't, that can't explain it. Really, there's no accountability because people are given the special- passes with acquisition. Well, they get fired, but they still keep their money. Whatever it is, there's really no company. So this has been a pretty depressing description of acquisitions, right? At this stage, you're saying, what the heck do I do if I go work in m or I go to work for a company that grows through acquisitions? Let me give you a glimmer of hope. And to see where this glimmer of hope comes from, I'm going to make you choose. Okay? And you're an acquiring company. I want you to pick the choice that's going to give you the better odds of creating value from acquisitions. No guarantee. So given a choice, would you rather be a sole bidder in an acquisition or be part of a bidding war? As, as the acquirer. So basically, it's from the acquirer's perspective. I want you to tell me what choice will give you better odds of succeeding. Be the sole bidder or part of a bidding war? Would you rather be on eBay bidding for something you want and have somebody bidding against you? Or would you rather be bidding alone? Do you have to think about this? When you want to bid alone, right? If you tell me I'd rather bid against someone, you're in the wrong game here. So you want to be a sole bidder. Would you rather go after a public target or a private target? Private target or public target? Work through the mechanics. When you go after a public target, what do you have to pay? Market price plus. When you go after a private target, you estimate the value and you pay a premium. Who knows what's built into the market price already? So given a choice, private targets give you a much better shot of creating value because at least you start with a base that's yours. Oh, definitely pay with stock. Would you rather pay with cash or pay with stock? Don't be so quick. Oh, really? What's it going to depend on? Depends on how good your company is. <laughs> no, it depends on whether you, let me throw in a word. Do some companies believe their stock is underpriced? Yeah, some right. companies believe the stock is overpriced. This has nothing to do with the quality of the companies, whether the lower market price is. We have underpriced stock. You don't want to pay with stock because it feels like you're paying with this value of a currency if it's overpriced stock. But here's the problem. There's game theory involved, right? Like if, if you're Tesla, you want to pay with stock. Well, I, that's, I don't think Elon Musk feels that Tesla is overpriced. I don't think he's going to play with, pay with stock necessarily. Would you rather go after a small target? or a large target, small or large relative to your size as a company? Where do you think your odds of success are? Oh, it's small. Anybody push for large? What happens when you go for a large target? You call mergers of equals, right? Big two big companies come together. 
They become case studies that you read about five years later about the terrible things that happen to companies and they try to kind of merge different cultures. Small jobs, cost synergies or growth synergies? What do you think the payoff is well, like? You build with growth synergies better. No, I didn't say that. I said growth synergy provides more upside, but cost synergies are more deliverable because you can plan for them, right? So we look at the, that's actually a data point. We'll see which ones actually get delivered more. So let's start with bidding wars. Every bidding war is a winner and a loser, right? What I mean by that is the day after the bidding war ends, there's one company that wins the bidding war and one company that loses. This graph actually shows you what happens to stock prices of the winning company and the losing company after the bidding war ends. I won't tell you which one's which, but if you see the drift up, that company is doing well. If you see the drift down, the company is doing badly. So the date of the bidding war ending is day zero. So they both start at zero. Then I'm tracking both the winner and the loser of the bidding war. Guess which of these lines is the winner in the bidding war? You don't have to get to the key in those top lines. <laughs> so it's the stock that is down 25%. If you win a bidding war, your stock goes down 25%. If you lose a bidding war, your stock price goes up 15%. Why do you think that is? Why is winning a bidding war so dangerous? You overpaid, probably. Yeah, so. If you go to the winner's curse in auctions, it's actually a well-established finding that if you have an auction and you win an auction, you always should have mixed feelings about winning an auction. Part of you should be happy, I won what I bid for, but remember, when you win an auction, everybody else in the room thought you were paying too much. That's something to keep in mind. It's a winner's curse playing on. So if you have a company involved in a bidding war, pray and hope that it's the company that loses the bidding war. If you look at buying small versus large targets, for the most part, buying small targets is much better. So if you look across all companies, all kinds, so small companies are the only ones where you get the line, the number above the line, the positive returns. The larger the company, the bigger the potential losses to you. Mergers of equals have a far lower chance of succeeding than mergers. But there's an interesting dichotomy that shows up in stock versus cash. If you look at cash deals, pure cash deals, it's the only type of deal where larger deals turn out to be better than smaller deals. Trying to do a large all you know, stock-based deal works against you. And here's why. Let's say you're trying to do a deal and you offer to pay with shares and I'm the target company shareholders. The minute you offer to pay me with shares, what are you telling me about your own shares? When did I say you use your own shares? They're overpriced. That they're overpriced. So guess what I do? I push up the premium, I demand, because I, this is game theory, right? I'm not going to be stupid and say, I'll take the same amount. So big deals funded entirely with stock, the premiums tend to zoom, and that kind of works against you. Private versus public targets. So the blue is the public targets. You can see the public targets are always the worst. Why? Because you have to pay market price for this. But there's actually an interesting finding your private targets versus subsidiaries sold off by public companies. So you know what I mean by subsidiary? Basically, you take a company like GE and it sells off GE aircraft. You're buying a subsidiary from a public company. Buying a subsidiary from a public company is actually even better than buying a private company. Why do you think that might be? Why do you think there's such a big payoff to buying subsidiaries from public companies? I think they just get bad advice because a strategist comes into a multi-business company. What are they trained to tell you that get rid of your bad businesses? And then they will say words that I think are extraordinarily dangerous at any cost. So guess what these companies do? They take their worst business and say, will you take it off my hands? And they sometimes even pay you, but just take it off my hands. I want it out of my... It's the way that Tata Motors bought Jaguar Land Rover in 2009 from Ford. Ford was desperate to get rid of Jaguar Land Rover and Tata Motors got the deal of their lives and saved Tata Motors as a company. So if you want to build a company around acquisitions, keep these in mind. And finally, if you look at growth versus cost synergies is from a McKinsey study that looked at 77 companies where there were growth synergies and 92 companies with cost savings. Let me cut to the chase. Among the 77 companies where the motivation was growth synergies, about 30 of those companies actually delivered close to what was promised. Among the 92 companies that were driven by cost savings, 66 of those 92 came in pretty close to estimates. 
And the reason is not that difficult to see. You have cost synergies, it's easy to plan for them, you can actually deliver them. Growth synergies are, tend to be fuzzy. And if nobody's responsible, it doesn't get delivered. So if you think about the odds of success here, can you pull off a merger with synergy? Absolutely. But you got to make sure you pay the right price. You got to make sure that somebody's held responsible for delivering that synergy. It doesn't happen magically. That one of the things KPMG saw in the 16% of companies that delivered in synergy is somebody was held responsible. In fact, my preference is take the guy who pushed for this merger, make him responsible or her responsible for delivering the synergies. It'll be amazing how, how quickly the numbers start to come down in the forecast when people learn, I have to be responsible for delivering the 35% margin. Let me make that 25% better. But we need that accountability. So here's the bottom line with acquisitions. Can you succeed in creating value from acquisitions? Yes, but it requires incredible discipline. And it also requires knowing when to stop. And let me finish this class with a story. The story of a company called Cisco that you've all heard about. In the 1990s, and we talked about this a little bit about Cisco's growth during the 1990s, it went from a $4 billion company to a $400 billion company, right? And how did it do it? Through acquisitions of small companies with promising technologies. Okay? In fact, there are SWAT teams. That, that, they, they actually had a team that landed these young companies. They were incredibly good at it. Harvard Business School actually wrote a case study in 2000 about Cisco and how amazingly successful. And whenever Harvard Business School writes a case about it, it's usually a death knell for whatever you're trying to do. Because in the following decade, guess what happened to Cisco? Its market cap went from 400 billion back to about 80 billion. And it continued to do exactly what it did in the 90s. And what went wrong? Well, the game changed, the market changed, but they didn't really seem to realize that they, they kept doing what had worked in the past. If you're going to be an acquisition-driven company, you need to know when to stop. And that's really difficult to do because this is the only way you've grown in the past. And now I say you can't do acquisitions. You've got to figure out ways to go back to, to organic growth and you don't have the structure built up. So you've got to build some kind of transition from acquisitions to organic growth. Are you going to get stuck being Cisco? as you try to keep growing when the odds have shifted a bit. So take a look at those, you know, much of what we've talked about goes back to core valuation, but take a look at those slides and uh, take a look at those tests and make sure you pass all seven. So I'll see you next session.